Today, um, 16th May 2024, I must begin this program with a brief discussion of the assassination attempt on the Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico that took place yesterday in a um, country area, rural area, near, to, near the Slovak capital, Bratislava. Now, this attack apparently happened following a cabinet meeting. The um, a attempted assassin was almost immediately cap was almost immediately captured. His identity is known. He has admitted his role in the assassination attempt, which is hardly up for dispute, given that it took place before multiple witnesses. And it turns out that this um, attempted assassin is a supporter of Slovakia's liberal opposition. Now, this is entirely unsurprising. I am aware that there is a photograph circulating which seeks to suggest that this individual um, was at one time involved in some kind of paramilitary unit which had some kind of pro-Russian orientation and that he received training from this unit. I understand that photograph, or at least I've seen uh, claims that that photograph is a fake and can therefore be disregarded. One way or the other, as I said, it's clear. The identity of the assassin is clear. His motivations are clear. He has not made any attempt, apparently, to conceal them. As for Fizzo himself, he was badly wounded. He was apparently conscious when he was brought to hospital. He's had um, extensive surgery. His situation is said to be stable, but there are contradictory reports, even as of this morning, about whether he is still in danger or not. We'll have to see. In the meantime, there's been a strong international reaction to this assassin assassination attempt. Um, Fico's friends, Prime Minister Orban of, of Hungary, President Putin of Russia, President of China, most of the world, in fact, I say friends, but Western uh, um, governments around the world have reacted with horror, as one might expect, at this attack. In the West, that's proved to be less so. Western governments have generally also condemned the attack and wished Fizzo a recovery. But I'm sorry to say that many, many Western media outlets have once again brought up the fact that Robert Fizzo is an opponent of the um, arms deliveries to Ukraine and um, an opponent of sanctions against Russia, or at least some of the recent sanctions against Russia. He is repeatedly referred to as a populist, as pro-Russian, as all of those things. And, well, I'm not going to discuss it in this programme, but there's been a broadcast on British television which made some really astonishing and given what has just happened, I thought deeply inappropriate comments, not just about Fizzo, but about Slovakia, saying that it, under his leadership it was drifting towards authoritarianism and that it was in some way an unhappy country, which I have to say I, I found at this particular time, a most astonishing thing to say. Well, anyway, that's the news about Fizzo. His election a few months ago did mark an important shift in Slovakia's policies. The previous government had been fervently supportive of the European Union and of its policies with respect to Ukraine. Fizzo has reversed that policy. Um, if Fizzo dies, which I most emphatically hope 
he does not, then I suspect that he's, the parties that um, he leads will continue to form the government and no doubt for a time at least they will continue to follow the policies that he um, has outlined which seem to have majority support in Slovakia. However, it also has to be said that when a charismatic leader leaves the scene, it's often the case that there is a consolidation of political forces committed to his line, but without his leadership, without his ability to reach out and to win over people, over time, that consolidation starts to become brittle, political shifts happen, and it's not impossible that we could see the same in Slovakia with a drift back to the pro-EU, pro-Western position if it should turn out that Fico is gone. So anyway, we will see, and we will see how um, what happens and whether he recovers and whether if he does recover, he will be able to lead the Slovak government again, and whether he will, he, he will do so with the same drive and energy that he has shown over the last few months. Now, inevitably, when an assassination attempt like this happens, there are many speculations and lots of uh, theories uh, that suggest that the attempt, the murder attempt, was carried out not just by one individual, but that some larger conspiracy was involved. As of this moment in time, we don't have evidence of this. I'm not saying that's impossible, but I want to stress again, we don't have evidence of this. And I'm sorry to say that in every country, Dangerous and angry individuals um, are around who are capable by themselves of doing things like this. Having said that, even if, as is possible and as initial indications may suggest, this individual did indeed act on his own, as I said, it may be that as the investigation continues, we will find out, we will find more information that might suggest um, otherwise. But if we, even if we assume that he did act on his own, the fact that an assassination like the attempt like this happened is a product of the very heavy, angry atmosphere that exists across Europe and indeed the West at the present time. Anybody who speaks out and criticizes Western policy um, with respect to Russia and the Ukraine war is guaranteed to encounter criticism. If they are the leader of a country, the prime minister of a country, they're going to encounter even more criticism. The uh, criticism is often on a scale and of an abusive quality, such as I have never seen. It is deeply intimidating um, to those who are on the receiving end of it. And, of course, it poisons, in general, the entire political atmosphere that exists in any, in any one country. Now, I am not going to pretend that I'm familiar with the internal political situation in Slovakia itself, but I understand that the supporters of the former Liberal government, the political parties, many of the political leaders um, of that former government in Slovakia have reacted very badly and very angrily to the fact that they were defeated and they've been on the attack almost continuously um, 
making similar criticisms and leveling the same kind of abuse at Fizzo that others who take the stance that he does can expect to receive. And as is generally the case in Europe now, these people also have the support of a great part, perhaps the greater part, of the Slovak media, which not only echoes, but amplifies this abuse and these criticisms. And, well, as somebody who's worked with people or has had to advise people who are angry and often unbalanced, <laughs> what I can say is that people who have those kind of issues, if there is a atmosphere of abuse and criticism focused on one individual or on one particular group, some of these very angry people that are there will attach themselves to it, and given that they're ang angry and unbalanced, will sometimes, as a result, resort to extreme measures. I've seen this happen before. I've seen it acted and played out. And I wonder and rather suspect that might, this might be what has happened in this case. So to reiterate again, even if no other person was involved in this affair, other than the individual who was behind, who was, you know, participated himself in this attack, the fact that this attack took place cannot be separated from the wider climate, which is one which has never, to this extent, in my opinion, ever existed in Europe before at least since the end of the Second World War. Now, I've often said that it's important to start dialing de things down, that this hysterical atmosphere is going to, is, is quite likely to lead to all sorts of terrible consequences. In fact, we see that playing out every day. But those who are intent on generating this horrible atmosphere show no interest or um, indications that they are willing to dial things down in any way. Certainly none of them has accepted any responsibility uh, for the events that we've just seen in Slovakia, they would certainly never admit that this constant abuse and vitriol that they're generating has played any role in this event. In this event, and I'm afraid I expect this kind of thing, this this heavy atmosphere, to continue, and I would not be surprised if more incidents of this kind take place in Europe and possibly in the United States as well. Anyway, there we are. That's what I'm going to say about the assassination attempt on Robert Feet. So I ought to make it clear, perhaps, that I'm not excluding any possibility. We're still in the very early stages of this, of the investigation into this affair. It may be that we will discover um, more facts that will lead us to develop further possible conclusions. But at the moment, I think what I have said is all that one can say. And in itself, it is enough. It, it explains, I think, a great deal about what has happened. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say today about this event in Slovakia. To repeat once again, I hope Fico recovers and I wish well for him and for his family. 
Let's now turn to other matters. And there's two great events taking place at the moment. One is the continued conflict in, the, in Ukraine. The other, of course, is the continued conflict in the Middle East. But alongside those two great events, a third event is also taking place, which is perhaps not quite of the same epochal importance, but nonetheless is important all the same. And that is the meeting in China between the President Putin and President Xi Jinping of China, but also of the top figures of their respective governments, the Russian and Chinese governments. I will return to discuss that later in the program, but this is an important event, and we're starting to see more information coming out about the kind of decisions that are going to be made over the course of this summit meeting. I will say more about it shortly. I'm going to first begin, as I often do, with the situation in Ukraine. And here we're going to start again with the situation in Kharkiv region. Now, Zelensky, as he so often does, has now visited the region. He's in actually, as I, I believe, as of this moment in time, in Kharkiv city. He's meeting Pre uh, General Sirsky there. Um, he's speaking about a very difficult situation in Kharkiv region. But the word that the Ukrainians are now trying to put back, put out is that um, the Russians have, um, have been stopped, that the situation has been stabilized. They've said this, it must be said, about the situation in Kharkiv region before. They've on previous occasions claimed that the situation in Kharkiv region had been stabilized. But anyway, they're trying to say that again. And I've noticed that in the media, in the West, in Britain, in the United States, they've also been discussing quite extensively what has been happening in Kharkiv region. And though they too think that this is a relatively limited offensive by the Russians, involving a relatively small number of troops, they still are taking a generally very bleak view about Ukraine's overall prospects. So what is exactly happening on the front lines in Ukraine? Well, the short answer is that the Russians are now focused, it seems to me, on capturing these two important places, Lipsy and Fovchansk which were clearly their major uh, objectives uh, when that offensive was launched um, five days ago. It seems astonishing that these events have only lasted five days. We've seen such dramatic news and outcomes over those five days. But anyway, the Russians seem to be focused at the moment principally on attacking and capturing these two places. Lipsy, um, a large village um, immediately um, south of Belgorod. In fact, it lies roughly midway between the Russian border and Kharkiv city, and Vovchansk, uh, a much bigger place, um, a small town, around 17,000 people on the Volsha River. Now, if we talk about Volchansk, um, the uh, consensus appears to be that the Russians are now in control of pretty much all of Volchansk, or at least the main part of Volchansk, north of the Volsha River. And apparently that is the major built-up, populated area. The Russians have um, captured either most of it or all of it. There are some reports that they've also sent troops uh, beyond the Volcha River and are now attacking positions to the south of the Volcha River as well. But this is disputed. 
and there's uncertainty about whether or not that is actually happening. Um, anyway, the battle for Lovchansk continues, but it doesn't seem as if the Russians are well on the way to capturing certainly all of Lovchansk to the north of the Volcha River and are probably likely before long to cross that river if they haven't already done so and capture the rest. They're also positioned to the east and west of Vovchansk, so they're in a position to attack the Ukrainian position south of the Volcha River from those two directions as well. And perhaps, for all I know, that is what they're going to do. There are also now multiple reports that they have entered Lipsy, that they've captured the Dacha area. A lot of villages and towns in the former Soviet Union have Dachas, Dacha areas close to them, places where uh, are small cottages which people in this part of the world often retreat to on weekends. Anyway, that the Russians have captured this Dacha area um, uh, to the north west of Lipsy, and that they are attacking, um, they're likely to storm Lipsy itself at some point within the next few days. As I discussed in my program yesterday, it seems that the 79th Brigade of the Ukrainian army, which is being redeployed to um, this area, um, they have they're saying that the Ukrainian command has made a decision that the that Lipsy and Vovchansk are not going to be defended, that the Ukrainians are going to instead establish defense lines um, further south in the immediate vicinity of Kharkiv itself. And, well, there's been a lot of discussion and commentary about the fact that the uh, Ukrainians failed to build proper fortified lines or minefields along the border. But the Ukrainians are now also coming up with a new alibi for, their, for the collapse, the sudden collapse that took place over the five days which have just passed and which enabled the Russians to move across the border with such speed. They're saying that the reason is that the prohibition from the United States on using Western equipment to shell positions in Russia itself, that this made it impossible for the Ukrainians to mount an effective defense on the border. And that was why the Russians were able to advance so quickly and occupy so much territory without the Ukrainians being able to offer any significant resistance at all. Well, that may be true. I doubt it, actually. But it still doesn't explain why no minefields or trenches or proper fortified lines were created in this area. And anyway, if one follows that logic, the Ukrainians ought to have established their main defence line significantly further from the border than they appear to have actually done. For the record, I've been thinking a great deal about this Russian operation. To reiterate again, it seems that the number of Russian troops who are involved in this operation is relatively small. The main Russian armies remain in Donbass and continue their main operations, which are in central Donbass. I think that partly this operation in Kharkiv was intended to do various things. It was intended to provide a buffer zone around Belgorod, putting Belgorod city itself um, beyond the range of most Ukrainian artillery uh, pieces. And that might indeed eventually happen. It hasn't 
fully happened yet, by the way. That's probably one possibility. The second, undoubtedly, is to stretch and extend Ukrainian defense lines to force the Ukrainians to redeploy more forces to this area, um, which could have been more effectively used in the main battle area, which is in Donbass. And the third, I think, is simply to reoccupy territory that the Russians conceded to Ukraine following Ukraine's offensive in Kharkiv region in autumn 2022. As I said in my programme yesterday, until the autumn of 2022, for most of 2022, in fact, the Russians controlled this area of the border. They controlled Lipsy and they controlled Volchansk, and that did put them close to Kharkiv. What then happened is that in the summer, after Ukraine completed its mobilization, its major mobilization that took place over the spring and the summer, the Russians found themselves heavily outnumbered because they'd delayed a mobilization of their own and many of their contract soldiers had decided to return to civilian life after their six-month contract terms expired. And that left the Russians very short of men against a much bigger Ukrainian army. And they decided in, they would therefore um, retreat and consolidate in the area that really mattered, which is, of course, Donbass. And so they pulled all their forces out of Kharkiv region. And I think that over time, they have realized that this was a disadvantage, that this was gave the Ukrainians more opportunity to maneuver their forces, more operational space, as I think the military people like to say, and that it had actually been useful for the Russians to keep troops close to Kharkiv, to be able to shell Ukrainian positions in Kharkiv, to interfere with supply lines there. So I think what the Russians are basically doing is that they're reactivating the front lines that they put to sleep in the autumn of 2022. They're, re they're intent on reoccupying the ground which they gave up at that time. That might, by the way, include an incursion into Sumi region as well. But I increasingly doubt that there is a Russian plan to try to reoccupy the whole of Kharkiv region. Now, as to what is going on in central Donbass, with all of this enormous attention that's been focused on the fighting in Kharkiv region, we have been getting less information about what has been going on in central Donbass. And some have been drawing conclusions from this, that there is some kind of operational pause going on there, that the Russians have um, decided to um, stop in the Ocheretino area and rest and rotate troops and regroup. That's possible, of course. But... What I have discovered repeatedly over the course of this war is that the fact that we're not getting a great amount of reports from a particular area of the battlefields is not a sign that the battle, the fighting in these areas, has necessarily stopped. Now, if we're talking about Ocheretino, the reports from a few days ago was of the Russians gradually advancing towards Novo Alexandrovka, northwest of Ocheretino, and towards uh, villages to the 
west of um, Occiretino, specifically a village called Soko. Um, whether the Russians are continuing with those operations or not, I do not know. It does seem that they are active and still advancing in the area of Umanska, which they have brought fully under their control. And in Italovo, further south, a village that they have also largely captured, but where there are still Ukrainians holding out, able to protect themselves behind certain water barriers, which are making the Natalovo operation complicated. And, of course, the other reports that we were getting, again, from a couple of days ago, was that the Russians have pushed the Ukrainians to the very fringe, the northwestern fringe of Krasnogorovka, this small town that lies between Avdevka and um, Marinka. And again, we haven't heard much more about the situation there, though I think it's likely that the Russians, having captured the rest of Krasnogorovka, are going to work towards pushing the Ukrainians out of this part of Krasnogorovka as well. It's likely that they're building up forces, they'll be in a further push, and at some point over the next few days, we'll probably get a report about this. But anyway, that's the lack or absence of news from the Ocheretino, Avdevka, Krasnogorovka area. It does not mean that the fighting there has stopped. By contrast, we have been getting a certain amount of information from the Chasofya area. There is a lot of discussion about the importance of Chasofya and that if Chasofya falls, this will completely unravel the entire Ukrainian defense line in um, Donbass. There's been a huge article by uh, Roland Oliphant in Daily Telegraph today, which basically says the same thing. Again, it does look as if the Russians have been clearing positions around Chasov Yar. Um, there are reports that the Ukrainian troops in the micro district, which is now the scene of heavy fighting, that the Ukrainian troops there are in effect trapped and in some sort of a cauldron, and that the Russians have advanced and are preparing to storm a village called Kalinova to the north east of Chasov Yar, which will position the Russians, where they can cross the canal and attack the main part of Chasov Yar from the north. And of course, we've had lots of reports that the Russians have established themselves along large areas of the canal to the south of Chasov Yar as well, and are preparing to cross the canal there also. And again, the last report I got was that the Russians have now reoccupied most or perhaps half of the village of Klesheyevka to the southwest of Bakhmut, which had been a major objective for the Ukrainians in their summer 2023 counteroffensive. So anyway, the Russians appear to be... Um, Pressing forward, maybe the main focus at the moment is Chasov Yar, but we don't know this for a fact. It's simply that we're getting more reports from Chasov Yar than we have been recently from the Ocheretino, Krasnogorovka, Avdeevka area, simply because, as I said, so much of the attention has now been drawn to the events in Kharkiv region. There is one other area which it might be worth keeping in mind about. There were reports that the Ukrainians have pulled out most of their troops 
from Kherson region, uh, the West Bank of Kherson region. There were a lot of claims and theories a few weeks ago that the Ukrainians were planning some major advance onto the they were going to cross over to the east bank of Hasson region, that they were going to reoccupy the village of Krinki. There were some reports that the Ukrainians had actually already done that, that they'd crossed the Dnieper and had indeed already established a significant presence um, in Krinki. The Oliphant article in the Daily Telegraph that I mentioned um, still appears to believe that, that there is still a Ukrainian presence in Krinki. I have always been sceptical about those claims, and I think that um, the latest information fully confirms that. Uh, there are no Ukrainian troops permanently stationed in Krinki. From time to time, maybe the Ukrainians might send raiding parties there, but they have no presence in Krinki. And the fact that they're bombing or trying to send um, FPV drones attacks and conducting strikes on Russian positions in Krinki in effect confirms that the Ukrainians have no troops there. But anyway, the Ukrainians are said to have redeployed their forces in Kherson region, the Kharkov region, to pull all their forces back. And it's been suggested that if there was a plan to cross the Dnieper and to restart the fight for Krinky all over again, misguided and disastrous idea that that would have been, well, it's been suggested that that idea has now been basically shelved. Well, that's as maybe, but there have also been lots of reports and suggestions and theories that the Russians themselves might be planning to cross the Dnieper. Now, yesterday, the Russian Defense Ministry said that they, the, the village of Rabotino in the Zaporozhye area had again fallen under Russian control. Again, there's various people who want to push back on that, dispute that that is really the case. For the record, I'm sure that the Russian Defense Ministry is reporting the situation accurately. The Ukrainians say that they are counterattacking towards um, Rabotino and they're trying to recover whatever grounds they lost. Probably they are, but I doubt that these counterattacks will be successful. Rabotino is now, therefore, at least in my opinion, under Russian control. The Russians securely control the east bank of Kherson region. And we've had various tell telltale reports and indications at various times that the Russians might themselves be considering a cross river assault that they might be preparing to cross the river into Kherson region and basically advance there as well. Well, I don't know whether this is true. There have been reports, film in fact, of Russian troops conducting exercises in this very same area with laying pontoon bridges and Again, many people have made deductions about this, that this is all preparatory to some planned operation to cross the Dnieper. Who knows? There was a rather tantalising report in TASS, um, which appeared today, and it does perhaps hint, or perhaps is intended to hint, that the Russians might be planning some kind of operation west of the Dnieper. We read that uh, the Ukrainian army has about 
2,000 strong garrison in Kherson. This is Kherson city. And has amassed its major forces in the suburbs. The Kherson resistance guerrilla unit commander told TASS on Wednesday. That suggests that there's some kind of partisan war going on, um, that the Russians have organized some kind of partisan war in Kherson region. I mean, it's the first I've heard of it. Um, one wonders whether that's true. But anyway, um, he's then reported as saying, there have been relatively few troops in Kherson lately. They're actually stationed in the suburbs. The garrison itself numbers 2,000 troops at best, and they're scattered across various deployment areas. Ukrainian service members have been moving little in the city, and normally only at night. So, Tass is telling us that there is a resistance movement in Kherson, and that there are only 2,000 Ukrainian troops in and around Kherson, that the major metropolitan area of the city is barely under Ukrainian control, that when the Ukrainians do enter this part of Kherson city, they're only able to do that at night, presumably during the day, the resistance is in control. What are we to make of all of this? I'm not sure that I place a great deal of weight on this report. Some of it may be purely made up. Maybe there is no resistance force in her song. But it has been published by TASS. And just possibly, maybe, it's intended to hint that the Russians are thinking of returning to Kherson again. Or maybe it's intended to make the Ukrainians think that the Russians are thinking of returning to Kherson again. In which case, the Ukrainians might be induced to overstretch their front lines all over again and redeploy still more troops back to Kherson region depleting their forces in Donbass still further. Who's to say? Anyway, uh, let's see. Now, I would make one observation. The recapture of Rabotino might make an operation in Kherson region. Um, it might make it more um, appropriate at this time with Zaporozhye now firmly under Russian control and no realistic prospect of the Ukrainians mounting a renewed offensive there. This might be a good moment to start an operation in Kherson region if that is indeed what the Russians are thinking, just saying. And the second is that the Ukrainians have again launched another missile strike at Crimea using Atakam's missiles. They're claiming that the Belbek air base in Crimea was their primary target. Um, they're making all the usual claims that they've destroyed uh, Russian aircraft there, including two MiG-31 fighter jets. Um, I'm not saying these reports are untrue. I've seen absolutely no corroboration for them. As I've pointed out many times now, um, unfortunately, one cannot rely on the reliability of these sort of Ukrainian claims. They may be true or they may not. Who's to say? Um, the Russians, so far, the Russian Defense Ministry has not yet provided its update about the Belbek attack. And it could be once we get the satellite data, as we did following the recent attack that took place, the attack that took place some um, weeks ago on another Russian airbase in Crimea. And when we find out more, we will see that this attack has actually been unsuccessful as well. But anyway, let's wait and see and find out what exactly did happen over the course of this attack. It could be 
that the Ukrainians are worried about, the uh, Kherson situation, that that's why they're attacking Crimea. Um, it could be that they're worried that there's a Russian build-up going on and that the attack on the Belbek base was intended somehow to disrupt Russian preparations. Anyway, there we, we will just have to wait and see. Now, that's my summary of the situation on the front lines as of today. The most dramatic news continues to be in Kharkiv region. As I said, the Russians now working to capture Volchansk and Liped, uh, uh, Lipsy, likely to capture them fairly soon. And a major Russian operation starting to develop in Chasovya. What we can now say with a fair amount of confidence is that the Russians are working according to a plan. And we know this because no less a person than Vladimir Putin told us as much in a meeting he had in the Kremlin yesterday with military district commanders. In other words, with Russia's military leadership. <clears throat> now, this is an important meeting. In fact, there were two very important meetings which took place yesterday in the Kremlin, in the same room, by the way. They took place back to back. The first of these meetings appears to have been a meeting, this meeting with the uh, military commanders. Then it was followed up shortly after, an hour later, with another meeting with the, um, um, with the commanders, with the heads of Russia's military industrial complex. Two people, three people, attended both of these meetings. Um, these were Putin himself, and the other two people who attended both of these meetings were the outgoing defence minister, Sergei Shoigu, who actually appears to have organised both of these meetings, and the incoming defence minister, um, Andrei Belusov. Interestingly enough, both Belusov and Shoigu wore civilian um, suits. They, they were not dressed in military uniforms. Anyway, over the course of the meeting with the military commanders, Putin told us this. Action continues. He's now talking about the special military operation. Action continues according to the plan prepared and approved by the group's command, the general staff, and all the objectives are being achieved. Not only last year, I would like to repeat this, but overall, all enemy counterattacks have been repulsed. This year, our troops have been steadily advancing across all theatres every day. Once again, they are carrying out every mission planned by the Ministry of Defence and the General Staff, and this is exactly what the nation expects. So Putin has told us, and he's told these leading military officers, that there is a plan, and that the plan is indeed being carried out, and carried out successfully. So there is a plan, it's just that we don't know what it is. We are left guessing. And he also went out of his way to reassure the military commanders that despite the changes in the leadership of the Defence Ministry, the switch of Shoigu to the Security Council and the appointment of Belousov, um, he made it clear that there is not going to be any change in the military leadership, that he is pleased and happy 
with the way in which the military themselves are conducting the operation. As for the general staff and the entire structure responsible for our combat operations, no changes have been made or will be made. I would not like to make this absolutely clear. The block of our command activities has taken the final shape and is working smoothly and effectively. No changes have been envisaged. This is all I wanted to say in my opening remarks. So there's not going to be any change. Valery Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff, attended the meeting. He was there. He's there in the actually very extensive uh, photographic study that the Kremlin has provided. Um, so um, uh, Gerasimov is there. He remains chief of the general staff and he remains the overall commander of the forces in the special military operation. And Putin is happy with the way in which all the other generals, Toplinsky, Lapin, and by the way, on that, uh, probably just by chance, the photographic study has been um, singling out Lapin very closely. He is, by the way, the head of the Leningrad military district, and it is the Leningrad military district that is providing the troops that are conducting the, the Kharkov operation. I'm just saying. So anyway, we, there were lots of pictures of General Lapin, and there were lots of pictures of General Gerasimov, and we have been told confidently by Putin, he's put aside any doubt about this, the military command structure is not going to change. They, the military officers charged with conducting the special mo military operation are doing their job well, and Putin has no intention of disrupting the work of the team that has now been created. And I ought to quickly add that there were some reports a couple of days ago that Surovikin, who's back in Moscow apparently, also attended this meeting. Well, I've now examined the photographs carefully. He wasn't there. <laughs> Just saying. Now, that meeting tells us, as I said, that there's a plan and that... Um, plan is being carried out. We don't know what the plan is and that Putin overall is happy with his generals. Putin went out of his way over the course of this meeting and over the course of the follow-up meeting with the leaders of the military industrial complex to make it clear that Shoigu is in no sense in disgrace. He says things like this. I would like to thank Sergei Shoigu for what he did over the past years in terms of building up the armed forces and promoting transformative changes. I think we can all say with great certainty that we have been consistent in our efforts to overhaul our military, including by adapting the present day imperatives and to the latest methods. Mr. Shoigu will be moving into a new role he will assume the post of Security Council Secretary and will be in charge of a constitutional body. This is one that's just been established, formed by the President, with a mandate to assist the Head of State in leading the country on military and law enforcement matters. And elsewhere we go on to read that he will also be responsible um, for... Um, arms exports, for managing Russia's arms exports. Mr. Shoigu will not only act as Secretary of the Security Council, but will also supervise the functioning of the Presidential Military Industrial Commission and the establishment of the Federal Service for cooperation with foreign countries. I believe that Mr. Shoigu understands better than many the importance of fulfilling our obligations to partners on the export of weapons and equipment, considering that we must give priority attention to the requirements of our own armed forces 
it is an extremely delicate and significant combination. Mr. Shoigu will be doing this jointly with the Defence Ministry, the Ministry's leadership, and the Chief of the General Staff. And Putin had equally uh, favourable things to say about Shoigu um, in his address to the military industrial people. Um, um, he says that um, um, it is essential that you continue the work started in the day by Mr. Shoigu. What does I mean is that we need to make the defence ministry outward looking and uh, that they must all work together successfully in the field of military industrial matters. Mr. Shoigu is aware of the needs of the armed forces like no one else. He will use the Office of Security Council Secretary to engage in this work as part of the Military Industrial Commission and work with our international partners to fulfil our contractual obligations to supply weapons to our partners in foreign countries. Now, Shoigu is not in disgrace. Gerasimov remains in overall charge of the special military operation. The team that's conducting the special military operation are doing their job well. Putin is happy with all of them. Now, Putin also went to great lengths to explain the reason for the appointment of Belousov. And um, he said that the military has now massively expanded its footprint in the Russian economy. Now, he gave some figures, which were very interesting figures. He says, I would like to remind you that the Soviet Union's aggregate defense and security spending amounted to approximately 13% of GDP in the mid-1980s. In 2024, our total spending on defense and security will be about or slightly more than 8.7%. The approximate figure will be 8.7%. This is less than the 13% the Soviet Union spent, but is still a considerable sum and a major resource which we should use sparingly yet effectively. Now, the interesting thing about that is that his figure on uh, the share of GDP that the Soviet Union was spending in the mid-1980s is undoubtedly too high. It was widely published at that time in the Western media, claims that the Soviet Union was spending between 13 and 15 percent of its GDP on the military. But I understand that within academic scholarship, as more data has come to light since the Soviet Union collapsed, that figure has been significantly brought down. And I ought to say that just a short time ago, I read um, other Russian officials, again, I forget the exact place, but other Russian officials I, um, discussing the Soviet Union's spend on defense in the mid 1980s. And they gave what I recall was a much more accurate and reasonable figure of around 7%. So he's bumping up the share of defense spending by the Soviet Union. But he's now saying that the total spending on defense and security that the Russian government at the present time is undertaking is 8.7% of GDP. Now, I will say straight away that is higher than I had seen Russian officials claim before. I suspect that this is the top figure. Um, it's probably the peak figure this year. I suspect that we're going to see a decline in that percentage in 2025 and going forward as the major investments in expanding the military industrial complex that have been carried out since 2022 start to become embedded and are in place. So there'll be less need for capital investment in enlarging and expanding factory space and doing that sort of thing. But anyway, 
his point was that given the size of the military industrial complex now, the share in national resources that it is taking, this is why he's appointed Belosov to take charge. And he says that Mr. Belousov has been Minister of Economic Development and a presidential aide in the president, presidential executive office. And for the past few years, he was first deputy minister, prime minister in charge of economic matters. It goes without saying that he knows very well what should be done to incorporate the economy of our defence and security center, sector and the defence ministry at its core component into our national economy. And we've had a clearer explanation of all of this in the discussion with the leaders of the military industrial complex. And um, he says that we must concentrate, this is in the meeting with the members of the military industrial complex, we must concentrate for financial and administrative resources to achieve the goals that I mentioned earlier. The newly appointed defence minister, Mr. Belusif, has been working in the civilian economy until recently as deputy, the first deputy prime minister. Um, and the point is, and the point that he goes on to make, Putin goes on to make over the course of the discussion, is that defence ministry enterprises are expected to play a role in developing the civilian economy as well. Uh, even more needs to be done to expand the defence industries, keeping in mind that these enterprises should also continue to focus on diversification. We must be ready at any moment for these enterprises, which have done a lot and accomplished a lot in, a in accordance with our plans, to take additional steps towards this end. They must be ready to switch to the production of even greater volumes of civilian goods. You and I are well aware of the plans to achieve national development goals. These plans have not been scaled back, even though the special military operation is underway. We have many tasks to address, including in the social fit sphere. We must accomplish all of that whilst unconditionally abiding by sound economic and macroeconomic principles. This is vitally important. We must not allow any distortions of, uh, to affect the economy or industry. And he goes on to say that the decision to appoint Denis Manturov, the former industry minister, to the role of first deputy prime minister in charge of the economy is also connected with a program of industrialization using the defense industry sector, the military industrial complex, in effect as its core. Mr. Manturov, who's in charge of industry, was appointed first deputy prime minister. With that purpose in mind, this was done to demonstrate the importance of the field that he has been engaged in over the past several years. We must concentrate financial and administrative resources. This must be done in a wise and prudent manner. The funds, quite substantial, that are being allocated for improving the military organization of the state must be used in the most efficient way. I've just mentioned that Mr. Manturov has been appointed first Deputy Prime Minister for this purpose. And he goes on to say that Belousev, as Defence Minister, will continue 
to remain in some way responsible for the development of the civilian economy as well. Um, the newly appointed defense minister, Mr. Belarusov, has been working in this role as first deputy prime minister rec uh, uh, until recently. This may go beyond the formal procedures we have, but as defense minister, he will still keep track of, econ of the economic aspects as he has been doing all his life. Now, in the Soviet period, it was absolutely standard for defense ministry and enterprises to produce civilian goods. This is one of the great difficulties about drawing the distinction in the Soviet Union and today in Russia between the civilian and the military parts of the economy. In Russia, the same factories that produce military goods also produce civilian goods as well. So to give the example, the Ural Vagon Zavod factory in Nizhny Tagil, which produces um, um, tanks, makes, builds tanks, also is one of Russia's major producers of rolling stock for the railway system, and also for large amounts of other heavy industrial goods, including, by the way, drilling equipment for the oil industry. And in addition, and what Putin is clearly alluding to, and this is one of the facts that he points out about Belousov, um, what Putin is also talking about is the need to ensure that technological developments in the military industrial complex get crossed over and start to be used more most effectively in civilian industry as well and going back to his meeting with the military officers he talks about how uh, Belousov um, is going to do this very thing. He says, we see and understand that growing defense and security expenses are intrinsically connected with civilian industries, which is boosting economic development as a whole and increasing the number of jobs. The unemployment rate is currently at a historic low in the country. This connection between cannons and butter must be organically incorporated into the general development strategy of the Russian state. I hope that Mr. Belousov will accomplish this task in the best possible way. On top of everything else, he has recently been doing, doing some dual purpose things at my request, such as the creation of unmanned aerial vehicles and other drones. Sergei Shoigu was doing the same as at the same level, at the uh, uh, same at the level of the defense ministry. So, what we're seeing again is a kind of reversion in Russia to a very heavily reformed and reorganized model. Not exactly the Soviet model that existed um, in the actual Soviet Union, but rather the kind of model that um, Russian economists, Soviet economists like Yevsey Lieberman in the 1960s were always talking about, the kind of economic model that possibly Alexei Kosygin the Soviet Prime Minister um, in the 1960s and 1970s also wanted to implement. Of course, Kosygin was the man that Belousov's father once worked for. Anyway, a, a kind of system where 
Planning structures absolutely continue to function, where the state continues to play what would once have, what, you know, an earlier generation would have once said, you know, play a major role running the commanding heights of the economy, the big military industrial heavy industry complex running, um, playing a major role operating the railways, the transportation system, building up infrastructure, doing all that kind of thing, all the big things. But doing so against a framework where prices find their levels according to supply and demand, thereby ena enabling planners to plan much more efficiently because they're getting proper and correct uh, price signals, and where the consumer economy is adequately provided with a full range of consumer goods, which are produced overwhelmingly by light industry, privately run, run and privately operated. In Kosygin's day, um, he had wanted basically, or so it seems, to transfer much of the consumer goods and light industry to um, um, collectives and things of that kind. He, in those days, outright private ownership would not have been acceptable. We're talking about the Soviet Union of the 60s. But of course, in today's Russia, it fully is. Um, so the, the state will control the commanding heights. It already controls the banking system to a great extent. It will control heavy industry, uh, machine building, high technology. Of course, the elements for that are already in state ownership. Rostec runs much of the military industrial complex. Um, Rosatom run, builds the nuclear power stations. There are lots of other major um, sectors in the big industrial economy that are basically state-led. But of course, the rest of the economy functions, you know, completely independently, run running itself, private enterprise, not only operating but actually encouraged, um, business people allowing to set up their own businesses, run the things themselves. As I said, it's to those of us who took an interest once in Soviet economic policy decisions, it's Quite interesting to see how the ideas that were circulating in a completely different, as I said, political and economic environment back in the 1960s are finally in effect, are finally being put into effect as a res um, in effect, in part, in consequence of the pressure of the current war, but also, and I have to say this, this has been the steady trend ever since the 2008 crisis, the financial crisis, the global financial crisis of 2008, which basically in Russia discredited the neoliberal model. I would add, and I've talked about this being a Soviet-style model, but if you go back to the period before the revolution, if you look at the economic thinking of that time, of people like the, the Tsar's finance minister, Sergei Vita, you will find that his thinking was not that different from what we're seeing implemented along these lines as well. 
Now, will this work? Well, of course, time only will tell. But I'm going to say that the fact that Russia sort of reverts to these models and the fact that having done so, it seems suddenly much more at ease with itself, far more confident of what it's doing. The European Commission has just published a report which rather grudgingly concedes that consumer confidence in Russia is at its highest level since the first imposition of the sanctions in 2014. In other words, that there is a widespread mood of optimism across the country. One can't help but feel that this is partly a reflection of the fact that economic decision-making is now being made in a way that suits the Russian social and economic landscape. The neoliberal model never really worked in Russia. In the 1990s, when it was applied, it created an absolutely appalling socio-economic crisis, which I can remember very well. Um, to the extent that it still functioned in the early 2000s, up to the 2008 crisis. Well, there was significant economic growth at that time and a very significant increase in living standards, but there was also great inequality and there was great frustration that important industrial sectors, like, for example, the aerospace industry, were uh, not developing and were, in fact, in, de in decline. And basically, since the 2008 crisis, we are gradually seeing a return to what perhaps is best understood as the classic Russian economic model. Now, of course, and this is, of course, the point that Putin is making, this can only work at all if financial discipline is very strict. And that's why he talks about the imperative need to preserve macroeconomic stability and to prevent distortions. In the case of the Soviet Union, financial discipline from about the mid-1960s began to break down and um, that was all but inevitable given that the price structure was so distorted because the government fixed prices. The current Russian government shows no intention of doing any such thing. It's going to use the price mechanism to keep itself fully informed of what is actually going on in the economy, thereby hopefully maintaining financial discipline more effectively. But will it succeed? We shall see. But it is the direction in which Russia is going. Now, of course, this also closely resembles what China does. And tomorrow, when I turn to discuss what Putin and Xi have been talking, to, talking about with each other in Beijing, um, I will obviously talk further about this. But the synergies, the managerial and conceptual economic synergies between China and Russia are becoming much closer. Anyway, this is where I finish my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again um, that you can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals Rumble and X, 
You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to check out our shop where you can find all sorts of amazing things, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again. More from me soon. Have a very good day.